It's time to get the story behind the story. Interviews with newsmakers, newsbreakers, and Vermonters making a difference. WCAX presents 802 News with Mark Johnson. Here's Mark. Even now, almost four years later, there's so much we don't know about the coronavirus. Why some get it, others don't. Why for some it's like a cold, while others are hospitalized and millions have died. One of the great mysteries is why some people are still profoundly affected weeks, months, or even years later, a condition commonly called long COVID. Its effects can be debilitating and devastating, extreme constant fatigue, brain fog, and depression. For some, long COVID is so severe they take their own lives. Charlie Valley was one of them. Charlie grew up in South Burlington. He was active in youth sports. When he was a kid, he moved overseas when his dad, Skip Valley, was named ambassador to Slovakia by President George W. Bush. He developed an interest in foreign affairs and security issues. At Colgate, he earned a degree in international affairs and had a website where he tracked Islamic terrorists. He later went on to work for the Defense Intelligence Agency. It was while he was there in early 2022, he came down with COVID but couldn't shake it. Months later, in May, depressed, he took his own life. He was 27 years old. In this edition of 802 News, Skip Valley talks about his son and the Charles M. Valley Foundation the family started to fund research into possible long COVID cures. First, a word from our sponsor, Red Hen Baking Company, whose support we greatly appreciate. At Red Hen Baking Company, they believe pure, uncomplicated ingredients in the hands of skilled artisans are the building blocks for great food. They're dedicated to creating the best food from the best ingredients. You'll find an ever-changing lineup of delicious pastries, sandwiches, and soups at their beautiful cafe off Route 2 in Middlesex, just off I-89. Their breads are also available in many other locations. Led by owners Randy George and Eliza Kane, Redhead and Baking Company has been on the leading edge of the local food movement since 1999. Where I want to begin is... You know, I read your eulogy. People that haven't, don't know you, don't know your family, tell me what the essence of Charlie was. Um, I think the essence of Charlie was goodness. Um, like he's a kid that never got in trouble. I remember them, his classmates, at, when he was at Colgate University, telling us how he was the person that uh, people would turn to when they were too drunk or got in trouble to sort of navigate everybody home to to safety uh, uh, he everybody loved him he was unassuming at his funeral uh, um, as I say in that eulogy and, and could announce he was a defense intelligence agency uh, essentially a spy I guess uh, but an analyst uh, in the anti-terrorism group and Denise and I knew that but nobody else was allowed to know who we worked for. And when, after he died, the DIA, we were able to tell people that he worked for the DIA, and a large contingent of his fellow agents came to the funeral. And I remember one of the agents saying to me, we are shocked. We didn't realize Charlie grew up in, in this kind of family and, and you know, with, with you know, a prominence in Vermont. Uh, he, he was just, he never would disclose that to us. He was unassuming and, and we took him for what he was. And I think that's his, his greatest strength is just sort of quiet integrity. Why do you think he got into that line of work? Did that surprise you? Uh, it, it didn't surprise me. And I, listen, I think it, 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 he used to play pool at the embassy. So when we, when I was ambassador, Charlie went there at 11 and came home when he was uh, uh, 13 or 14. Okay. So it's a very impressionable age. And on top of the residence uh, in in Slovakia, in our in the ambassador's residence in Slovakia, there was this big dome with fabulous views of all of Bratislava. And in that dome, I put a pool table. And so guests would play pool up there. The kids would play pool up there. But one of the recurring set of guests were the Marines. And as you may or may not know, there's a contingent of Marines in every embassy in the world that guards uh, embassy personnel and the classified information, <laughs> not necessarily in that order. And the I, Charlie and I would always invite these Marines down 
just to relax at the residence, and they all would end up playing pool, Charlie pool with Charlie. So he was fascinated at that age, I think, with the military. And one of the college, uh, uh, so he was seriously considering going to the Naval Academy as a soccer player. And the Navy soccer coach came and looked at him in Vermont. Charlie went down uh, with us, and we had multiple tours of the Naval Academy. And sort of at, at the very end, the Navy coach sort of said, hey, Charlie, you're the most wonderful kid, but I, I'm not sure you could play here. And I think I talk about that a little bit in the eulogy. And so I said to him, I said, Charlie, listen, you know, I think with your grades and your scholarship and your interest, you could go to the Naval Academy anyways and not be a, you know, someone playing soccer. Would you like to try to do that? And he said, mm, you know, and this happens to a lot of kids. They get wrapped up in their sports. No, I think I, think I want to I try to play my sport. So even in the college application period of his life, he, he was interested. And on this wall over here, there's a uh, uh, hand, uh, uh, a painting of a Marine with a flag behind him at salute. That's what Charlie did for me when we were at the embassy. Wow. So at least in terms of the military, that was something he was always interested in. And then when he was at Colgate, he started, he started uh, first year Arabic. Um, my wife's family is uh, Lebanese, several generations of immigrants. Uh, but her, her mom um, spoke Arabic growing up, so Arabic would be a natural um, language. I think that part of the world probably he was interested in because of his heritage, probably because of the challenges of terrorism. And so Charlie you know, was an Arabic major, international affairs majors, major, and then he got really focused on the, on the counterterrorism a bit and had an actual website at Colgate in his junior and senior year that tracked jihadis. I mean, who does that, right? So this, he really got interested in that. He was helped a lot by a professor uh, at Colgate who had similar interests, who became kind of his mentor. And so that, that's kind of where he got his interest. And then his summertime jobs were always related to, uh, to counterterrorism. I, I, again, I say in the eulogy, um, I talk about his trip to Israel working for their Center for Counterterrorism. I mean, that was an eye-opener. I mean, he's doing special projects for, you know, the ex-head of Mossad. I and mean, that's pretty heady stuff. Uh, and then he had um, a, a summer at a really respected uh, think tank. Actually, two uh, really respected think tanks. The Institute uh, for the Study of War, which, as I, again, as I say, has the really good updates. Uh, originally on the Ukrainian war, but now they, they have subsections on uh, the Israeli current Israeli war. So it's a really respected um, think tank. And then um, finally at CSIS, uh, where he uh, became under the wing of Seth Jones, who's the, the head of the counterterrorism group. And CSIS, he, what's that? Uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's kind of a nonpartisan um, foreign policy think tank, but really, really, really well respected. Did he talk to you before he took this job? Um, yes. You know, he would, as he was interviewed, um, and the conversation was, you know, Dad, I'm, I want to be in the action. I just don't want to study stuff. I really want to be in the mix. And, you know, what, are, you know, what options do I have? Options for somebody like him is, is what they would call the agency, which is the CIA. And he had... I can tell you extensive discussions with them, you know, early on. Um, Defense Intelligence Agency, there are branches of the um, of, of of the military that are not necessarily related to intelligence that he considered as a civilian. But the sp precise job of the DIA was so interesting that uh, I felt that he or he felt that he uh, he, he couldn't turn it down, and. I think he, he told me he was on a group of 50, like at the very end. And then, and I'm not sure they're supposed to do this. It's supposed to kind of be through a system. But the guy saw him in the resume. And you can imagine, as I've just described, what his resume was like, right? And the guy says, well, listen, I, I want to meet this guy. So he had this surreptitious meeting with the person who became his boss. And once he liked him, they cut through the tape and hired him. So he then went to Tampa 
you know, by himself, you know, solo apartment, um, and worked on the uh, McDill Air Force Base, which houses Central Command, which is now all the Middle East, the military part of it, um, and uh, Special Operations Command, um, uh, you know, sort of an affiliated uh, military branch, uh, all on McDill Air Force Base. And, and, and this is right after college. Yeah, this is, I think he spent a year, I think he spent a year at CSIS or a year and a half at CIS and at CSIS and then down. So he was a civilian employee. And then um, I think in his second year there, he was the civilian employee of the year for Special Operations Command. I mean, I said, Char, what do you, what do you get? He said, I, I get a parking spot. <laughs> what was he like growing up? Uh, he was, he was always the go-to kid. Um, everybody loved being with him. He was a talented athlete. You know, he was a, um, in the end, a multi-sport athlete. He was the South Burlington High School goalie for a while on a hockey team. Um, but both boys were pretty focused on the, the Far Post Soccer Club, uh, uh, program. I think they might've both played for Nordic for a year as they were, when they were much older, but, you know, um, uh, Todd Kinsbury's program was wonderful, uh, a growing uh, focus for them. He, he was also an outdoors kid. He, you know, my two children, Charlie was most like me in terms of my outdoor interests. And when we were in Slovakia, he would always go on the hunts that I would go on. Uh, he would hunt here. Uh, in, in his older years, he got very into the quail hunting that I do a lot of in, in the South and, you know, would bring friends down. Uh, but I, I think that that people really um, looked to him for leadership. I mean, he was the captain of of the uh, South Burlington um, soccer team. Um, he was captain of the Taft. He went for his last two years of high school. He repeated a year at Taft. He was the captain of that soccer team. Um, and uh, I think just people looked to him for leadership always. I was interested driving up here this morning. You've got two soccer goals in your yard. And those were when the kids were young. Uh, they were always occupied with friends or, or, um, or others, and they liked. They used to like to line up and, and make me the goalie, and shoot at me. And I would taunt them, and you know do what I could to save. Well, <laughs> they wanted to repeat it after they both graduated from college. <laughs> I think they were shooting at me, not 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 for the corners, but it was a little bit different. But that that fuel was always active during, uh, you know, during the season. Tell me about your older son. So his name is Teddy, uh, and he is my city boy. He works for a hedge fund in uh, Miami. Uh, fascinated by markets, and fascinated by how how you can invest to beat the markets. Recently married to a wonderful uh, um, Vietnamese American woman, uh, um, uh, who uh, came here when she was seven to Philadelphia and and, and grew up in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, we're actually going to leave tomorrow uh, to go to Miami and spend Christmas in Miami. It'll be the first time I've had Christmas in such a warm atmosphere. Charlie was going to go on a second assignment when he got ill. So Charlie was was to be um, uh, deployed uh, this time to Iraq. First time he was deployed was to Jordan. Okay, and we knew that we couldn't know that we couldn't know where in Jordan. I actually suspect it was Syria, but so we never knew where other than the fact that he was in Jordan. The second time he could disclose to us he was being deployed to Iraq. And then I just found out afterwards, you know, from the DIA guys, his deployment was going to be to Erbil, which is the Kur in the Kurdish area. Okay, and he would be supply, su uh, supplying um, intelligence again. I think to Delta Force again. They couldn't tell us, but that's I think where they were deployed on uh, his specialty, which was uh, jihadis in in um, in the Middle East. Um, and that deployment, I think, was after they had got uh, Baghdadi's successor and, and tried talking the eulogy about how Charlie was involved in that. Um, and I remember Charlie had left his car in South Carolina where we spend our winters um, because he didn't want to leave it in Washington while he was deployed. 
and we were going to drive him to Fort Bragg in North Carolina for deployment. And I remember him calling us and saying, Dad, I'm, we don't need to do that. I'm going to come get the car. I've told them uh, I don't feel comfortable being deployed because my brain is not functioning, and I can't do that on an active military operation. And so he'd actually gone through. So when you go to a, um, a war zone, um, and, and I guess for some reason they didn't consider Jordan you know, as, as much of a risk, but Erbil was, was a risk. He had to have specialized security training, you know, pistol training, defense things, you know, stuff that you wouldn't know. So he went through two weeks at Fort Bragg, maybe in January. I mean, he got COVID mid-January, so maybe this was mid-February. So he pushed his way through despite having a non-functioning brain or all of that security training. And nobody knew otherwise. But when it came time to be deployed, he said, wait a minute, I can't, you know, I can't make, you know, fundamental uh, connections in my brain. I can't do this to my, and, and DIA was great. They understood. And he, by that time, was in D.C. He had been transferred from uh, Special Operations Command to the DIA Counterterrorism Center, which is in suburban Virginia. So he was doing a kind of a reverse commute to D.C. where his apartment was for about a year and a half before uh, the deployment was to occur. How regularly was he keeping in touch with you after he first was diagnosed with COVID? You know, a lot. I mean, we, we uh, vacationed with him for a week. And then, um, and, 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 you know, we, we saw that he was suffering a little bit, but... Yeah, I think he had a good way of hiding things. You know, we knew we knew it wasn't great, but I but alarm bells did not go off in, in either of our minds about you know, and part of it I think he concealed a lot of the agony that he was in. And then he came to Vermont uh in late April and spent a week with us. You know, Denise said, Hey, let's go to Washington and, and spend some time with him to see how he's doing. I said, Well, why don't we have him come to Vermont? That might be a good way to, you know, get out of that little apartment. So we did. And then he went with his girlfriend from Vermont to a wedding on the West Coast of a fellow DIA person, I think. And it was after he returned and she came back to Vermont for a bit that that um that he died. So, you know, certainly in the last month we had two full weeks with him. But again, just no clue that 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 he was suffering more than you know he chose. It sounds really as though it was more mental than physical. I mean, I've known people who've had COVID; they're basically in bed. Yeah, no, no, no. He was fully ambulatory. Wow. Um, but it was it was. I mean, as he would describe it, you, he would go to the grocery store and not be able to shop because he didn't know what aisle he was in. That kind of thing. You know, that's kind of that, 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 this immense brain fog. Couldn't read. He could not read. Now, here's a person who spent his life or his professional life reading and analyzing and sifting through data. And he, and he couldn't do, you know. I mean, I had, I had sent him a book, you know, kind of not thinking about this. And, uh, um, you know, because he would send me a spy book. I'd send him a spy book all the time. Um, and I said, oh, this is great. I think it was maybe even a book on China or something. Um, and he said to me, he says, I want to be trans, he says, these son of a bitches, you know, gave us Wuhan, I want to be transferred to the China division. So angry he was about, about catching, uh, or get, getting long COVID. Um, but I remember him saying, dad, I can't, you know, thank you for the book, but I, I, I can't even, you know, I barely get, you know, skim the newspaper headings. Um, and he went to lots of doctors. It sounds like from he did. We had we had him. We had and we found psychiatric specialists. Um, you know there weren't really, and there still aren't many, long COVID clinics. Georgetown pretended to have one, and he went to it. And they said to him, the guy was talking to him, and not and said, "Well, why don't you try smoking pot?" And Charlie was like, "What?" I have the top, the highest security clearance in the world, and they want me to smoke pot. I mean, what? I mean, they didn't know about his clearance, but it's like this is all you have to offer me. So, again, that's one of the reasons we started the foundation is we just didn't feel anybody had any place to go because nobody has answers, and there aren't 
there still aren't a lot of answers. Um, so one of the projects that we funded out of the foundation is Dartmouth has a nice outreach program, uh, including a reading program and, 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 and you know, including a lot of sort of softer, non um, sort of scientific stuff or research stuff to help people get through you get through this because you can't go to work, right? And you can't, and, you know, the hope is with time, and I think that is a, a good hope that, that in the end the, the brain heals. Um, and what exactly is happening in the brain is, is, you know, kind of a primary interest to us. So our second research project um, is, is some, just, um, some wonderful doctors uh, from Miami who had uh, actually the, the, the primary doctor is a pediatrician that discovered that long that the COVID virus can be transmitted from mother to baby in the womb because he had he delivered a baby that had severe uh, handicaps and unfortunately the baby didn't maybe lasted like six months or so so he was able to autopsy the baby in the baby's brain and they discovered it was full of um, COVID particles. Wow that it affected the brain. So that got him really interested in, in, wow, what's going on in the brain of these COVID patients? And they began to do research on mice. And they came up with a, a blocking mechanism that they thought would, would keep the COVID from infecting brain cells. And so they had an, a, a pretty successful uh, string of research on mice, and we came in at the hamster phase. So they they move up the, in terms of the sophistication of the brain. So uh, that project is currently funding, you know, the effect of, of the of the um, the drug they've come up with on on and on the brain and the hamsters to try to figure out okay what's what can we do to stop the particles affecting the neurotransmitting ability within the brain. Given what you've described about him, I would imagine that the frustration he felt must have been just enormous. It, it, it was for somebody at the you know remember you know he's. You know, he has just been through, and I think he, he did it battling COVID, a situation where he and colleagues at the DIA had identified Baghdadi's successor. And it said, hey, we think it's this guy. Here's the data. And they got a lot of, and, and you know, the DIA guys told me this, so I'm not disclosing stuff I'm not supposed to. They got a lot of pushback, as, as it happens in the intelligence community, with this conclusion. No, it's not him. You got to be sure. You know, we can't put our troops at risk unless we really know. All that normal back and forth, I'm sure. But Charlie and his team stuck to their guns. And in the end, acting on that information, Delta Force raided, I think in Syria, this guy. He retreated into some back room and ended up um, blowing himself up. And in the end, they were absolutely right. He was Baghdadi's successor. And uh, you know, so Charlie, Charlie's analytical abilities and at that point, strength of character and sticking with his guns, you know, because some people, well, I, OK, we're not quite sure. And then no, nothing ever happens. Um, and I think that level of respect in for him. And then we also found out I didn't even know this. He was he had a team. He was the leader of a primary of the ISIS DIA's ISIS team. Um, and that, you know, that we didn't know till after. I mean, we knew he was a DIA agent and that he got all these awards. That's about all. And that he had been deployed X and was about to be deployed to, to Erbil. You said he was home in April. Did you get, I may even hesitate to ask this question, did you have yeah. any hint? Did he come to you and say, Dad, you know, I just, I'm not sure I can take this? Did you? No, I mean, he was, he was clearly, um, um, I don't want to say distressed, but frustrated. I guess frustrated would be the word. But when you're around him, you don't really see the symptoms, right? He, you know, somebody with with, with those symptoms can. You, you're talking to him, and that's fine. And, you know, um, he slept a lot. He was tired, and which is great. We wanted him to do that. Um, and you know, I, I remember at the airport telling him, "Hey, you're going to get better." So you had no, no, no clue. Whiff. No clue. And if we did, you know, we'd have done something a lot different. And did any of his friends tell you later? You no. Know, I, was, in I fact, was worried about Charlie. No. In fact, his best friend, who um, is also in that business, 
uh, was the one who found him. Well, who's the one, when he didn't respond, who led the police to his apartment and, you know, let the police break in and was there to identify Charlie. Um, and so we said to him, hey, you know, did you have any clue? And he says, none. His girlfriend, you know, who he's, you know, was very close, obviously, to, no clue. So so that part of, of what could happen, we were just oblivious to. Um and we just thought he's going to show, you know, he, he, he soldiers through these setbacks and just he's going to do that here. No mental health ever. Not in, in not, not of history at all. Not of consequence. Are you? Wow. Wow. Um, how did you get the word? We, we uh, you know, I hadn't, I, you know, I returned text probably. You know, later than I that should, but it, but his mom, you know, immediately, particularly if it's either of the boys, is receiving. She had not received a text from him since like eleven, and we were out to dinner, and, and we were in New York, and she didn't let me know that she was concerned about it. We just thought, oh, he's you know, because he, he forgets that he his phone is not charged, or you know, which happens. And then we were getting ready to go to bed, and we got a call from his older brother because the his friend and girlfriend had called him first to say, um, and that we were like shocked. So we got in the car and drove overnight to DC. And then we spent about three days in the, I mean, there was a whole logistical issue he, his apartment. He was in the DC coroner's office, which is a whole nother, you know, cough gas kind of experience. So it was like five or six days in D.C. before we could before we came back to Vermont. How do you even deal with that situation right there? Well, you, it, at that point, it was adrenaline, right? Because there was so much to do, right? Right. It's almost like okay, you have to do this. You have to do this. We we decided that we were going to have a, um, you know, where the, the funeral was going to be at the Newman Center. Well, they're not exactly set up for this. With so we had to find a tent to if there was overflow I mean it was I think we were so and then we we're going to have a reception back here at the house you know which has its own you know logistical so I think we were so I had I was going to write the eulogy so I really spent a lot of time on that so we were so I think taken up with with and then we got family coming by and calling and, and I think you're so busy kind of on logistics you don't have really time to it's just after everybody leaves you know, I read that eulogy. I, I don't how I don't even know how you could have possibly been capable of doing that. How did you pull? How did no, you? I, I practiced a little bit. It, it's but no, I'm talking about writing it. I mean, how, and deciding to even do it. Well, I thought he deserved it. But that takes just an enormous amount of. I don't even strength. It doesn't even come close to describing it. Well, you just once you. you there was one point that maybe people noticed, but other than that, I go through it. You know, um, but you know, I was in a in a in a church full of supporters, right? Yeah. And you say, I'm not, I'm not gonna let him down. What do you think happened here? You mean with? I think he just gave up in the end, in terms of why he killed himself. Um, but that goes contrary to everything you've told me for the last 25 minutes. That's why it's, that's why it's so stunning. That's why, and that's why we were so sort of ignorant to the, to the, and, and we said, cause he, we, you know, we, he, he had been sent cause this was a brain thing to one of the best psychiatrists in DC. Okay. To try to help him. And they changed, they gave him some a medicine you know, could be helpful for this. And so after, and this poor guy was just shocked. And so we had lengthy, he was very good about continuing conversations with us. And that's what we said to him. Did you have, any, you, you, this is your business, right? Right. Did you have any clue? And he said, no, because he says, if I had, you know, our tree, are we, you know, we have protocols and, you know, if there's some hint about this and, um, so, have you, in your, I'm sure you've done a lot of research on this, you've started the foundation, have you found that this is not as uncommon as 
we all may have thought? Uh, no, it's much more common than, than we would have thought. And which, you know, and that's one of the things we want people to work on in the studies. What is it about COVID in the brain that makes this kind of, of, um, of activity more likely, right? What is, that's what we're trying. That's what, when we do our research, you know, the, the, it's hard to find people who are focused on that, you know. The most interesting thing about the foundation, it's a lot harder to give the money out than it is to get it in because and we're, we're particular. We're not going to give it to just anybody. But, you know, focusing on what is actually going on in the brain that might lead to this. Um, and, you know, the best way is to, you know, try to kill the virus when it's in the brain or at least prohibit it from, you know, doing its dirty deeds. Um, have you learned anything in the course of this to help you better understand what might have happened to him? No, not, I'm not, not really yet. I, it's, you know, and there, you know, there are other little signs and I... I you know, if we, if we and you and so all the so when I was um, re removing all his belongings from his apartment, he had a really extensive book collection, and there were three books by his bed bedside on depression, and I was like, you know, and then so you say, well, if we'd been here a month ago and seen the book, we would have said, well, wait a minute, what's going on, Charlie? Are you depressed? Are you right? But he wouldn't. He didn't. If, that, if that's obviously if, if he bought those books, that was probably part of what he was going through, probably induced by the COVID. You know, we could have m maybe addressed it in a different way. But are you, are you sure it's the COVID? Yeah, I'm sure it's the. Well, I, you just never know. Uh, I'm pretty sure his 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 misery was so intense because of the COVID that I can't imagine that it. Right, I can't imagine that it wasn't a primary factor in what happened. How did that misery express itself to you? How did you, what do you mean when you say that? When you say misery, that's a pretty strong word. Well, he, he couldn't read, right? I mean, imagine if that's your, that's your primary identification in your career. So he, he, he tried to go to work and he finally said to them, listen, can I take a leave of absence for a bit? I can't, I don't feel comfortable. Forget the deployment. This is just working in the office. I don't feel like I can accurately wow. brief a general right so his his primary sense of being you know being an analyst in reading was non-functional or, or severely inhibited did you have conversations with him where he would just stop in the middle of the conversation no, no that and that's the that's what's amazing what's a, in, in, if you were doing a one-on-one -on -one with him you would you would not know that that he was ill in any way wow even, I mean, you know, we look at things in retrospect and you say, well, there was that afternoon or there was this event. No, no I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was clear to us that he was, he was frustrated and not happy, but not at all clear to us that, that this had reached, a, you know, a, a point where he lost his will to, to live. I mean, it just never, it never crossed our, it never crossed our mind, so... How do you um, how do you deal with this? I mean, it's one thing to lose a parent; that's the natural order of progression. How, how do you how how have you been dealing with the grief? Yeah, I I I just try to stay busier. And you know, if you're occupied doing something, you don't think about it. Um, the worst times are probably when you're by like when I'm driving to my farm. It's about 20 minutes from where we live, and he loved this place. That's the toughest. How is Denise? Same sort of toughness, right? Same sort of, it's tough to get through. She's uh, leaning a lot on, on her Catholic faith, um, which has been helpful to us both. Um, we both, you know, we, we try to stay busy. We try to find some um, progress in our feelings with the work on the foundation, knowing that hopefully others will, will benefit. But, you know, it doesn't get easier. Does it get different? Not yet. Mm -hmm. How about your older son? Um, that's, a, that's a good question because, you know, we're so focused on ourselves and um, I mean, me on Denise, maybe me on, she on me, is we don't realize, I mean, they were, they were uh, close, but we didn't realize till 
after Charlie died. How close? And um, I think and Teddy had a little startup company, and uh, he had to make a decision about whether he was going to continue to. It was a trading company, uh, a mini hedge fund. He was trying to decide if he was going to continue it, and then Charlie died, and he just lost all will to to do that and sort of step back from him. He ultimately got, got another job, but um, I think like. Denise and I, you know, there are moments when it really hits him. And he's uh, three years older? Three years older, yep. Because that's, that's a pretty tight... Yeah, and they're the only two boys, too. So they, you know, were wonderful at ganging up on their dad. So Yeah, particularly out, of, out, on, the, yeah. out on the soccer field here. What, um, you know, what, what have you learned about yourself that would be helpful for people to know? You know, just, uh, well, I think a lot of it's sort of self-criticism about why the heck didn't, you know, we see stuff. And I think, you know, if there's any question about a loved one and their health or their, you know, double down on trying to find out what's going on, you know. Um, And, you know, we got wonderful memories, but he's not here. You don't talk about how he dies, right? No, nah, not really. Does it matter? No, I don't think it matters. But, I, you know, I'm just... It's hard enough to lose a child, but I can't even imagine you having to clean out the apartment, all of that. I mean, that's just profound. Yeah, I mean, it was... Listen, we had a lot of... Um, uh, 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 Charlie's uh, uh, girlfriend, Basha, and her family, her sister in particular, were extremely helpful, you know, during that. The, his friends in D.C., there to help, um, although the boy that, that found him couldn't go back to the apartment. So, But, but other friends, it just put us in touch with people to do this or that. And, you know, and then we have to make, you have, you're, you know, this is like game time decision you don't want to be. You have to decide at that time, okay, what of his effects are you keeping? And, you know, what's... You know, we donated it all, everything to, chari- to charity, but you know, you gotta you gotta make that decision. You don't have time to go through everything. It was kind of a quick, you know. And these are all things, a lot of things we don't we'd given him, and now a lot of the stuff that had sentimental value we obviously kept. But that's, that was a tough day, tough couple of days. Um, you know, and I had just moved him into this apartment like eight months before, right? And he's got, where's his car? Yeah. We had to go find his car. Now, fortunately, somebody had the keys. So we, right? Well, he usually parks on this street. So, you know, and and in the car, he had the brand new registration from a week ago. Like, who re registers his? I mean, so he re registered his car a week ago. And you say, what what could happen in a week? And you've talked to all of his friends, I would imagine, and sure. and none of them had a clue. No clue. Wow. So you think this was just he decided, did it sort of on a yeah. on an impulse? You or? just don't know. You, yeah. You, you know, you just don't know. Yeah. Wow. What? Um. So tell me more about the foundation. What do you? What do you? concretely hoping to get out of this. Yeah, so we, we raised and gave, you know, slightly over a million dollars in the in the first year. We, we're not spending as much time fundraising, and we're, we're maintaining it. Fortunately, there's some interest income now to fund some stuff. Um, but we want the, the focus to be either programs that give current long COVID sufferers some hope, okay, uh, which is why we're helping Dartmouth with some of their outreach programs, or fundamental scientific research that says, what the heck is this damn virus doing in our, the brains of our 20-year-olds or others? Um, and, you know, we, 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 we've given out two big grants. We're close on a third, but we really are pretty particular. You know, we really spend a lot of time analyzing the because we want it to be exactly the kind of thing we want to do. And there's some wonderful people doing a lot of wonderful things in this space. Um, like what? Oh, just all 
all kinds of research on you know the precise uh, brain effects of long COVID. Demographic studies, studies about um, you know how people are, are are recovering over time to get some sense of of, of whether some of this is a permanent um, malady or if it's if it's something that over time as as the brain heals that uh, that people recover from. And they do. I mean, I there and I think. I, I tell you, I think that was part of the, this, this, what we were lulled into is you read about people suffering, okay, and it's awful, but eight months later, they're finally functioning in a way. And I think that's kind of what we said, hang in there, Charlie, this is, like I said to him at the airport, this is going to get better, right? You know, sometimes eight, six or eight months is too long for people. Uh, if that, and there, there, there are some more serious cases of this where people just aren't getting better. So there's, you know, it's a, it's a spectrum of, 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 of effects depending on your particular uh, pathology. Um, but, you know, programs that give some, some folks hope is what, cause that's what Charlie, Charlie had no hope at that point. And, you know, what, what concerns us is, is that, you know, we didn't realize that he was out of hope. We thought, you know, we just be patient. This will be fine. But, but you know, I mean, and I, you can't you can't beat yourself up about that. Yeah, you you shouldn't, I guess, but you do. Nothing you can do about it. And one of the things that's interesting is when you have these kinds of terrible tragedies, or you've had some health issues yourself. I don't know if this has been the experience you've had, but there are people that were maybe on your second circle of friends who really rise to the occasion. Have you had that happen with Charlie's situation? I'll tell you what, that is a really good point. The notes that we got from people that we only had casual acquaintance with and donations from some of these people to the foundation have been extraordinary. You think, and, 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 you know, you, I think growing up here, and, and, you know, we hadn't been in Vermont as much, um, certainly because it's locky and then because we go south in the winter time, And so you lose touch with some people, right? You know, there's the circle of friends that you develop because you're sharing the, uh, the athletic experience with, of your children, right? Well, once these kids move on, you don't necessarily keep in touch with those folks. Some you do, some you don't. And the outpouring of wonderful notes, you know, people that went to the funeral, uh, other people that have lost children, those are the most valuable notes that we we treasure because people get that they they really get what's going on and so that has been sort of the most wonderful result of this is that just you know like um, a service when we, the family used to have a heating oil business we got a note from a service repair tech you know who worked from us for us thirty five years ago I mean that pretty cool. How do you go on from here? You know, you just keep doing, you know, we're going to keep um, doing the foundation stuff. And, and uh, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time with our surviving son. Um, at some point, he'll probably have a family. So that'll be, um, I think, some solace. Anything else you want to mention? No, this is, I appreciate you doing this. Well, I, I appreciate you doing this. And, um, you know, obviously, it... I'm not going to say I'm sorry for your loss. That sounds too trite. And I, it's really, there's just nothing you can say to somebody. I have a, you know, I have a kid and I just, it's unimaginable to me. So, you, you know, Charlie's um, goal uh, in his professional life was to capture jihadis, people who have either done us harm or were threatening us. Um and I showed you earlier the picture of Zawahiri that he had in his apartment that I now have in a little section of my library, um, uh, you know, where I have some of, of, of Charlie's uh, books and, and awards that he got from DIA and others. And I kept the picture of Zawahiri up, and I had a little bit of um, of not solace, but satisfaction when our troops took out Zawahiri thinking, you know, Charlie did a little bit.
I want to thank Skip Valley for taking the time and being willing to talk about his son. If you want more information about the foundation the family has established, you can go to their website, charlesmvalleyfoundation.org. That wraps it up for this edition of 802 News. Thanks for listening.